life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details. And survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Hello. Hello and welcome to another episode of Sunday of the Dead. Season 2, Episode 7, Pretty Much Dead Already. And this is the episode that pretty much changes everything. everything. <laughs> yeah. Everything. Uh, a little bit about the stats. Uh, it originally aired on AMC in the United States in November 27th, 2011, written by Scott M. Gimple and directed by Michelle McLaren. This episode attained a 6.62 million viewers and it became the highest rated cable telecast of the day, as well as the fourth most viewed cable program of the week. This episode obtained significantly higher ratings than Courtney and Kim Take New York on E! and Real Housewives of Atlanta on Bravo. Total viewership and ratings for the episode significantly increased from the preceding installment of Secrets. And I think we all know why. Because the things that happen in this episode are crazy. But also, I mean, when you had the way things left off in Secrets you know that something was about to be boiling. Yes. And people are going to be talking around the water cooler being like, dude, you need to go back to Walking Dead, and it's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. We start off this episode where around the campfire with the group. They're eating. Carol is cooking. Andrea is sharpening their, her knife. Shane is, you know, kind of standing up eating his food. Carl and Lori are eating, and Rick is kind of zoning out mulling over things Mm -hmm. and at first I was like I wonder what's going on here but then I saw a deleted scene and it kind of put this in perspective and I really wish they had kept this in there would have been so good so during his zone out there's this whole montage of him carrying Sophia and then hiding her under the tree and then carry and then Carl gets shot And then he carries Carl, much the same way he carries Sophia. And then it kind of bounces around between different things with Sophia and Carl. So in his mind, he's kind of thinking about these two things that he regrets. Carl getting shot and Sophia getting lost. And it ends with a close-up of him, like, looking down the barrel of his gun. And so it's kind of like he... You see him, but he's slightly fuzzy. But the gun is, like, in your face if you were standing there. It is almost the same shot of what happens at the end of this episode. And the beginning of the next episode. Right. Uh, So I think if they had kept this in, uh, it was was such a good comparison scene that I was like, ooh. There was a lot in this episode, and I know they probably couldn't cut these things out, but that, I felt like, just made it so much deeper Mm -hmm. of, of what he's thinking about. Lori does notice that he's zoning out and w- and is like, oh, where'd you go? And he's like, oh, just thinking. Glenn, Glenn is over by the fire and he looks and Maggie's on the porch looking at him and she kind of like shakes her head. No, don't do it. You better not don't do tell it. that secret. Do it. And the camera angles are really great here. He, I, I, this is going to be the start of my love affair with the cinematographer in this episode. And we're going to talk more about that later. Daryl is in a camp chair. T Dog is by the fire. He's uh, I think he's pouring more things into his cup. Dale is kind of like way in the distance, and Glenn looks at him, and Dale nods his head yes. And poor Glenn is like, uh, what do I do? So he stands up, like the leader that he is, and goes, guys, guys. No one pays attention to him, guys. And he's like, the barn is full of walkers. And then they all kind of look at him. Uh, maybe this wasn't the best way to tell people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's being really direct and to the point, but and it just makes everybody just wet themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, he probably should have just stuck with telling Rick and Shane. Yeah. But I really love that there was like this huge dramatic pause and everyone just went, what? And then credits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was great. Well, let's take a look in the barn now that we're back from our mm-hmm. credits. 
I can see milling around eight or nine walkers. You said nine. I could see eight, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's where we are right now. Although, if you were listening in our last episode, we said that in the comics, Herschel says there are 14. Yeah. But I don't think that includes everybody. So we'll talk about that when we get there, too. Mm -hmm. Shane is looking inside, and a walker uh, is inside and, like, just comes and looks through this eye hole that he's looking in it, and it makes him jump. And I totally jumped. I have seen this episode so many times, and I totally jumped when I watched it this time. Did you? No, I didn't. Oh, well, that's sad. Uh, the close-up on the walkers that are in the barn as they're having this whole conversation, their makeup job is so fantastic. Like, the detail of the up-close work was just so great. I don't know if it was a mixture of the cinematography with the makeup, but it was so good. <laughs> so good. So no one is okay with this. Shane's like, are you okay with this? You shouldn't be okay with this. No, no one is okay with this. But Rick reminds them, this is not their land. This is not their barn. This is not their area. And Rick says they can't leave. Of course, we know why he's saying they can't leave. But Carol and Daryl are like, well, we can't leave. Because what about Sophia? And then uh, we know Rick is thinking about the baby here. Yeah. And Shane really has no tact at all. He's just like, he's trying to drive everybody to revolt. Mm -hmm. right now he he's trying to basically wrest control away to do what he wants at right. this point he wants to have control of the group again right although he does make a statement that i kind of agree with that if sophia had seen daryl with his ears around his neck and looking all bloody then she probably would have run off because he looks undead yeah i think that mm, that's a yeah. valid point yep. even mm -hmm. if he is trying to get a rise out of people a fight almost breaks out and Lori tries to hold Shane back and he's like, keep your hands off of me. And I'm like, oh, oh, now you want her to keep her hands off of you? You didn't before. Okay, dude. He just doesn't want to get scratched again. Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, so Dale tries to explain Herschel's mentality, which reveals that he knew. Mm-hmm doesn't reveal how he knew. And he also says that he, he's like, I actually felt that we were safe for another night. And we were. Why? Because they're locked up in a barn. And they've been locked up in a barn forever. And his family was never in jeopardy. It's, it's not like it's totally a herd. Um, when there's too many walkers all pushing on something like that, yeah, they're going to break it down. But at this point, they're okay. And also, the way that they feed the walkers drives them away from the, wall, from the door. Exactly. Because, they yeah, they feed them on the other side. But then the walkers start to hear all the noise that's being had outside the barn. And as you remember, Herschel has said, just stay away from the barn. Probably not not just to keep the secret, but also because the more noise you make, the more the walkers are going to get all agitated about everything. Mm -hmm. So they start to try to break the door. Everyone kind of disperses at that point. But Shane is circling the barn by himself, trying to assess things. Uh, the walkers are pushing against the door again, and Shane grabs for his gun. But his gun's not there. Because they have been locking them away and keeping them in the RV. So people aren't gun happy. So Gun goes to talk to Maggie. And she's gathering eggs. And she's still really miffed at him that he told everybody that this happened. So she takes an egg, puts it in his hat, and then cracks it on his head. All I could think of in this moment was when she tells Herschel a couple episodes ago, you know, she understands everything. She's not in high school. But this seems to be like a real high school move to me. It kind of does. You know, just, just a little bit. Um, and then I had the same question Glenn did when she, he's, he says to her, why did you waste the egg like this? And she's like, I, I think it was rotten. And like, his reaction wasn't Eva, why did you do that? He knew why she did that. Right. Yeah. And, um, she she kind of smiles as she's walking away. And it's not because she's gotten over it already. Mm. We can see later on. She's still just as mad later right. on. But it, she's just smiling at her own joke. Yeah, true. Okay. There is a continuity error. If you look at Maggie's blouse, it seems to shift from one shoulder to the next. Kind of off her right shoulder, then off her left shoulder. Uh, obviously, they've been doing this scene for a few times. but I, I'm sorry, I did not notice that. I'm a gentleman and I looked at her eyes. I call foul. <laughs> <laughs> 
at the camp, Carl is doing schoolwork with Lori. And this is something that I think I don't think about a lot. The fact that they're still continuing Carl's schoolwork. Yes, at the other camp, at the Atlanta camp, uh, Carol was still doing schoolwork with Carl and Sophia. Uh, and so I just forgot that that still happens. You know, I think it's cool. Yeah. He says he's not leaving until they find Sophia and maybe not even then. And that she think he thinks that Sophia will like it there. Which is also kind of interesting because in the comics, she is there. Mm -hmm. And she's there with them. And she does like it. She does. Um, In fact, Sophia in the comics actually outlives Carol. Wow. She outlives her mom. Um, And and I think Carol dies because she's all despondent. So she gets a walker to bite her. And that's how she dies. Wow. Yeah, it's really dark. I'm kind of glad they didn't go down that way. (laughs) I'm not there yet. I was just kind of reading ahead um, online to see how Carol actually did die. Because I know she did. It's really sweet that Carl is saying this about Sophia. Like he he's genuinely has feelings and cares for her and really wants her to be happy even when she's not there. And that's pretty cute. Again, the cinematographer on this episode, it's gorgeous. All of these shots are just artfully composed. I I just go go watch this episode and just watch how it's shot. It's beautiful. The director of cinematography on this episode is Ron Schmidt. He has also worked on Catch Me If You Can. Uh, He has worked on The Shield and NCIS New Orleans. Hmm. Besides this, which I thought was interesting. I mean, he's got stuff under his belt, but I think Catch Me If You Can was very well shot. It is well shot. Yeah, and and without trying to be too artful about it. It's just dramatically shot. We're at the stable, but Daryl is trying to take a horse out. He's got the saddle again. Did he ask? I wonder if he's talked to Herschel about this because, yeah. Carol says he needs to rest but he doesn't care. He's like, no, I'm just going to do this anyway. And she says, well, she does. Carol says that Rick is going out but Daryl says he just doesn't want to do nothing. You know, he Mm -hmm. wants to actually do something. So I think she is starting to come to terms with the fact that Sophia may actually be gone. She says she doesn't want to lose him, too, meaning Daryl. And the look on his face is incredulous. There's a super cool shot where his face, you see half of his face, and you see the back of Carol's head, and it's like Carol and Daryl are facing each other, and you only see, like, from his nose over. And it the way it was shot was just really cool because it was almost like he's half half the man he wants to be, which is... He wants to be a loner and a rebel, you know. But the other half of him does want to care about something. And so the part that's overshadowing him, the Carol part of wanting to care, he's really having that inner struggle about that. I don't even know if it's necessarily the man he wants to be. There's the man that his brother wants him to be and the man that this person he really cares about. Right. But he, he really wrestles with that. Like, he doesn't know how to react when there's a group and a community that cares about him, he doesn't want people to care about him, I think. Like, he feels awkward by it. And then he also thinks that Carol is starting to like him as more than just a friend, and he's he's not down with that. Um, so he gets so mad, and he, like, ends up hurting himself when he throws something, and then he has a mini tantrum and runs off. And compare this much later down the road with when Carol starts to suffer from dementia. Mm-hmm. And how the two of them are interacting there. They have literally swapped roles. Oh, interesting. I forgot about that. There's a deleted scene. I'm not exactly sure where it occurs. But it's between this scene and a scene later on where we find out where Daryl actually goes. And he goes to this dock on a, on like a, looks like kind of a pond Um, and he's just sitting on this dock and he's staring in the water and then he kind of looks around and he finds a Cherokee rose and then he runs off back to the farm. Mm -hmm. And we're going to kind of pick that scene up later on because you find out what happens after that. In the yard, Dale is watching the barn and Glenn is up on the RV and he's keeping watch and he asks for, you know, Dale, do you have a hat? And Dale literally gives him the hat off his head. 
Mm-hmm. Even though poor Dale is balding <laughs> and probably needs the hat more than Glenn does. But they have the umbrella up there. Where is Glenn's baseball cap? Uh, I'm more, more than willing. Somebody is going to go wash that for him. Right. Oh, wait, no, they do mention later on, I'll wash your hat for you. Oh, right. So he probably has just left it off to the side sitting somewhere. Gotcha. Andrea says that Rick is talking to Herschel, and then they're going to go look for Sophia. And then Dale cautions Andrea about Shane. He's like, stay away from him. Yeah, and she's he he's like, you don't know the kind of man that he is. And she says, he's not a victim. And then Dale says, you don't know him. Mm-hmm. And we think that this is just him repeating his his lines. But we've also been talking very heavily about how we believe that Shane came from an abusive home. Mm-hmm. We believe that he has all these things that have happened in his life. What if this is something that Dale is also suspecting? That he thinks that at one point in his life, Shane was a victim. Mm. And the person that he's become is compensation for that victimization in his early life. That could be, yes. Andrea and Dale have this whole conversation about Shane and whatever. Um, Glenn, on top of the RV, hears all of it. And the look on his face is like he's really grossed out by uh, hearing that Andrea and Shane have been getting it on. And uh, he might also be um, like, oh, great. This is another secret I'm going to have to keep. Isn't right. It? <laughs> exactly. So then when uh, Andrea leaves and Dale comes out of the RV and Glenn's like, oh, well, actually, first, Dale has this home moment where he's looking at the guns on the table and it's like very pensive. And you're like, what does this even mean? We will find out later with this. Yeah. So her, uh, Dale comes out of the RV and uh, Glenn says, are you OK, dude? And he's like, yeah. Can you go get me some water? Uh, and I'll help you keep watch. But then we we find out later that when Glenn comes back, Dale is not there. Yeah. At the farmhouse, Herschel is eating lunch and reading the Bible. And I picked up that this is Luke 8, starting, I believe, in uh, verse 25. And the page that you are seeing, very close up to the page, there's two very prominent stories. The first one is Jesus calming the storm. It's the the scene where Jesus and the disciples get into a boat and they cross um, the cross the the sea, and the storm gets so intense and they're all like, "Oh, we're gonna die!" And Jesus is like, "Shut up!" <laughs> and the storm shuts up. Then immediately after, when they get to the other side, there is this man who's possessed with thousands of demons, and Jesus casts them out. It's it might be random, but is it? I don't think it is. Because here we are in a place that is effectively the calm in the storm. Mm-hmm. And it is possessed of demons. I think it's also really funny that while we're doing this episode, just a little while ago, it started to get very rainy and stormy. You can probably hear the thunder. That is because we live in Florida and it rains all the time. And this this room that we're in is getting darker and darker because we haven't gone, hey, Google, office light on. We now have light. And so do you if you have something named office light. <laughs> Rick mentions that Herschel is doing some light reading. Ha 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 ha. And Herschel says he does it when... (laughs) Herschel says he does it where he can. So I have to point out here that I love reading while eating a meal. Uh, When I was in college, I had a friend who worked at the Spaghetti Factory. Holla, Spaghetti Factory. I wish we had one out here. What I would do, because the Spaghetti Factory actually closes after lunch and then reopens for dinner, is I would go right before it closed and sit at a table and either read a book or do some homework or whatever, waiting for her to get off. And then, you know, we would go home. And I think even at a young age, I was like that, where I wanted to read books while I was eating. I just think it's a really great multitasker. Yeah. And as... As I say here, feed the body, feed the brain, feed the soul. So Rick reveals he knows about the barn and he wants a discussion. Now, Herschel says, no, 
No discussion. I just want you gone by the end of the week. I feel like if Rick had led with, I would love to understand your viewpoint better. You know, maybe this conversation would have gone a little bit differently. Like, instead of just saying, I want to have a discussion about this. Yeah, because whenever you say, hey, I want to talk to you about something, everybody tenses up immediately. Mm -hmm. But when you go, hey, I just want to understand something from you. Because I think... I think I might learn something from you. Right. We all know that Herschel is smart. Mm-hmm. We don't. We know he's he's educated and he's he doesn't just make snap decisions. In fact, he's very stubborn. So I feel like maybe Rick is underestimating him a little bit here and not learning why he is doing what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Rick does make a good point that if that they themselves are alive and if Herschel sends them away. They might not be alive anymore. So aren't they, in effect, just being killed by Herschel? Yeah. And then he, he goes off to the kitchen to clean up his dishes. And Rick says something here that's that really stuck with me. He says, the world out there isn't what you saw on TV. It is much, much worse. And it changes you. Either into one of them or something a lot less than the person you were. Now... For those of you who uh, watched or listened to the podcast that I did on zombies with Jose, you might know that Romero, the, the big daddy of zombie flicks, used zombies as a symbol for cap, not capitalism, consumerism. Mm. And when you take that quote into that context, it really feels like it's true of the real world that this consumerist ideal is being shoved down our throat by the media. And the media tries to make us feel like this is a good thing, this is great, but ultimately the longer you are out there in this kind of a world, the more it grinds you down until you either give into it or you become less. Mm -hmm. It's so true of the real world. Rick is basically saying that they're gonna do anything that he wants in order to be allowed to stay. But Herschel is not budging. He's just digging his heels in. He's like, no, you got to go. So do you feel like Herschel is in the right here or do you feel like he's in the wrong? I feel like Herschel is in... It's kind of a complicated answer, actually. I feel like Herschel's in the wrong because he's not considering what is happening to the people. But in a way... Oh, and also the fact that he's not accepting their help. Yeah. But in a way, I think he has seen Gun Happy Andrea. He has seen um, Unhinged Shane. I I feel like he might be in the right in that situation because he doesn't know what's really going to happen. He's seen these people fly off the handle before. I, I feel... I, I don't really fully get him myself mm-hmm. because... Rick, at least, is offering to help work the farm to increase the security so that those zombies definitely won't get out. Mm -hmm. Possibly help get more of them in there, make people more safe. And Herschel is actually denying all of that because he thinks that some of the people in the group may go and kill his wife and set up son all over Mm -hmm. again. Right. He's just doing this out of fear is what I feel like. Right. He's more afraid of these people than, than the walkers. Yeah. yeah. Maggie actually hears overhears the conversation and she is not happy that the group is going. I think not just because of Glenn, although that's a very major reason, but it, I think it's also because she's like, you don't really know what it is out there. So yeah. that's the major point that Rick made. Um, back at the barn, though, Shane is still watching the barn, still stewing. And he mentions to Rick that there are over a dozen walkers in the barn. So definitely our counts of eight or nine missed a bunch of them. Mm-hmm. Rick is trying to explain to Shane about what's happening, what Herschel thinks, everything. And at that point, Shane's like, we're going to leave. We're going to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, at, I, if I were Rick at this point, I probably would have been like, go ahead. You can go. Yeah. Bye. Because at that point, the problem child, one, will probably take problem child two with him and go away. And more than likely, Herschel's reservations would go with them. 
Exactly. So this is totally logical, except Rick reveals that Lori is pregnant. And Shane is very shocked. And you can also see in his head wondering, is it his? Yeah. And then he immediately is like, we're going to go get the guns. And and then we've got to go get what's in these barn and we got to get rid of them to protect Lori and the baby. And, and Rick is going to go off and have another conversation with Herschel. And as he's leaving, Shane is like, oh, congratulations, by the way. And then after a delay, Rick goes, thank you. Because I and I hear this sarcasm in his voice. Because mm-hmm. I think it's like, is he saying thanks for the congratulations or thanks for the baby? Because he ha- he didn't reveal to Shane that he knows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. He knows that Shane and Lori. Yes. At the farmhouse, Maggie and Car- and Herschel have a discussion. Herschel says that Carl doesn't need his help anymore because he's healed. Maggie says they have nowhere to go. And we talked about this a little bit before. She says that all the farms nearby are burned or full of walkers. And says Herschel says he doesn't like that she started using the phrase walkers. This is an interesting Christian conundrum to me. Because Herschel thinks that loving the walkers is living by faith. But he is not living by faith if he's throwing this group of people out instead of helping him. And Maggie, on the other hand, is has changed her tune because she was uh, attacked yeah. by a zombie and she now kind of understands the animalistic nature of them. Yeah. So Maggie quotes, love one another as I have loved you. She says, you taught me that, dad. Um, she talks about how she acted out by smoking and shoplifting when he married Annette, which is her stepmom. So here's an interesting thing that I found, and I was kind of like trying to figure out how to do this in my head. And I don't know if you guys can hear, but the storm is getting a lot louder. Um, Maggie mentions that she was 14 years old when Herschel married Annette. And Annette is Beth's mother. So mm-hmm. Beth is really Maggie's stepsister. Unless Beth was born several years before Herschel and Annette were married, which is unlikely, given that what Herschel's religious views are, Maggie would have to be at least 14 or 15 years older than Beth. However, Maggie's age is established as 22, and Beth is only about five or six years younger. So, my theory about all of this is that Beth is not Herschel's child. I'm willing to bet that he married Annette who already had Beth. Right. And that also kind of shows, it explains the difference between Maggie and Beth. The two are very different people. Yes, exactly. You can tell that they both had similar upbringings, but they're very different people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so what we said before, Maggie definitely had her eyes open when she got attacked by that walker. And then Jimmy runs in and says, it happened again. And they all run out. In the yard, Rick and Andrea are planning another search. And then Herschel says to Rick, I need your help. So Andrea goes to the barn on watch. Rick goes with Herschel. Lori is cutting carrots outside. And Shane comes over to talk to her and does that stupid little squatty head cock thing. We talked about this in a previous episode. He does this when he's really like trying to assert his condescension and his, you know, egotistical mania. And he did it again. Shane says, Rick isn't built for this world. And again, he tries to make a play to get Lori to be on his side. And this is so tedious. It is. Yeah. And he claims that what happened at the camp wouldn't have happened if Rick hadn't gone to save Merle and hadn't taken... Uh, all these people with him. But since what actually happened there happened because no one was paying attention, Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I don't think that extra six blind eyes would have changed things. Nothing, because they all would have been around that campfire just laughing and having a good old time and not paying attention because they let their guard down for the first time, really, Mm -hmm. because everything seemed okay. I agree. Lori made a decision, said, no, the baby is Rick's. I decided. She says, there is nothing he can do to change that. That's not true. There are some things he could do to change that. If Rick is dead, then Shane can step in. 
Yet, I also am willing to bet that if at any point, sometime soon, Rick turns up dead, Lori is going to reject Shane. Because it, there's a motive. Yes. There's a really beautiful shot of Shane and Lori where they're in the distance. Shane is walking off. She's still cutting the carrots. And then you see the barn way off in the distance, mm-hmm. like down this rolling hill. Just remember, I'm here. Yeah. Always lurking in the back. Shane is really fired up after all of this. And then Carl wants to talk to him. He's been reading a book. I can't see what he's reading, but he kind of puts the book down. And then Carl basically makes another stand saying, we need to stay. Mm -hmm. And when he does this, he stands up and he looks Shane in the eyes and he holds himself the same way that Rick does when he's trying to assert his dominance. He even does the shifting side to side thing that Rick does when he's talking. Mm -hmm. He is basically trying to go, okay, this is how I know to to stand up. Right. And I actually heard a, a quote very recently. I think it was um, in The Maidens mm-hmm. by Alex Michaelides, uh, where he says that when a man begins to talk like his father, then people will just back down and mm. fall in line. Good. Because he is now a man. Mm-hmm. So Lori, as she's still cutting carrots, kind of looks up and sees that Shane is talking to Carl and she does not like that Shane could be manipulating Carl. But then Carl says, you know, starts, says a swear word, swear word, and Shane reprimands Carl for swearing. Number one, not his job. Yeah. Number two, hypocrite. Mm. (laughs) Yeah. Shane goes into the RV to find the guns and then swears when he can't find them. Yeah. (laughs) Potty mouth hypocrite. (laughs) Exactly. But we also know Glenn can hear everything that's going on in the RV while he's on lookout. So he can hear and feel Shane going all over the place and searching and cussing. But when Shane comes back out, he doesn't say anything. <laughs> Not touching that. <laughs> he is actually looking away. He he's he's basically like I'm I don't want to incur this guy's wrath, right. so I'm not going to ask. And then Shane asks him, okay, where did Glenn go? No, where did Dale go? I don't know. It's, and all the story came out mm-hmm. that Dale wasn't there when he came back with the water. In the forest, Herschel, Jimmy, and Rick are at a creek because some walkers are stuck. Now, side note, the two zombies were that they're getting out of the creek are played by a father and daughter stunt performers. Huh. Uh, Herschel says that he knows that the girl is Louise Bush, who worked at Hatman's Bar. That is not a real bar. I looked it up. Uh, he, he doesn't know who the man is, but he knows where he comes from because the uniform looks familiar. Mm-hmm. Herschel has this whole discussion about asking Rick to stop killing zombies and says if they want to stay, they have to treat them as humans. Can you do that, Rick? Um, it's still kind of stubborn, but at least he's negotiating. Now, there's a deleted scene here, which was really funny, and it it was them having the exact same conversation, but on coming from the other side of the creek. So instead of coming to the creek forward, they were, like, coming from, the like, the back part of the creek coming f- toward them, and it was almost the same conversation, and I was like, I don't understand the difference, but... Yeah. Same thing. So in another part of the forest, and near another body of water, we see Carol and Daryl, and they're walking along the water, and they see more Cherokee roses. This scene is what happened when Daryl was on the dock, saw the roses, and ran, grabbed to get Carol, and is now at the scene. We also forgot to mention when we did the Cherokee Rose episode that, of course, Cherokee roses are the official flower of Georgia. Yeah. So obviously, there would be Cherokee roses there in Georgia. So he takes it as a sign that he's going to find Sophia. And then he apologizes for the morning. And as they're standing there, there's this beautiful sweeping shot of, like, the water and a boat. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, everything in this is, like, really dramatic and almost like this calm before the storm. Look at all the beauty. Look at all the beauty. (laughs) Um, I'm going to call the next part Silt Creek because that's what they were saying. The zombies get caught in the silt of the creek. Uh, They are using the... uh, pole with the hook they rick calls it something later on i can't remember what it's called yeah it's basically an animal control pole Mm -hmm. yeah they're using that to get the walkers out of the creek 
And this is an early lesson in zombie kiting, um, which is a very valuable skill. It's used to clear out areas without wasting any ammo. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about kiting, uh, this is a term that's kind of taken from the video game uh, Killing Floor, where you attract the attention of one zombie or multiples, and then you draw them along. You don't see them doing that as often early on, but you see them do it more and more as the mm -hmm. series goes on. And this is an extremely vital skill for getting them out of things and drawing them into narrow areas where it's easier to deal with them. Mm. In the yard back at the farmhouse, Glenn sees Maggie walking down the road after she's picked some vegetables. And she, again, is still mad that he told everyone. But he says, alive or dead, they are dangerous and I just need you to be safe. And he says, secrets get you killed. Which is true. Yep. So he's starting to form into that leader that Maggie is seeing him have mm -hmm. the potential to be. And then she kisses him. And it's really interesting how I feel like this kiss is more intimate and more meaningful than the sex that they had not that long ago. It right. Just, this feels like it's a connection. Yeah, because it's more intentional, for sure. Mm -hmm. There's another shot in the forest. Seems like everybody's in the forest right now. Uh, Dale is walking through the forest with a bag of guns, and his intention is to hide them. So he had left the RV, and Shane figured it out. So he is going after him. And he's like, look, man, you need to give the guns back. And Dale says, well, imagine if you applied your tracking skills to finding Sophia. Burn. So burn. And then Dale asks if he's going to shoot him like he did Otis. Burn. Yeah, Dale, Dale is just letting him fly right now. Mm. But... Um, then Dale gets gets um, the return shot as Shane says, you know, in the cold light of day, you were pretty much dead already. Yeah, but that would be the title of this episode. That um, would be. And it's really ironic that he says that too, because aren't they? Isn't that the secret at the end of season one? Yeah. But there really is no reasoning with Shane in this whole thing there is something funny though somebody pointed out that if you look really closely on shane's shirt you can see these little like circles where the imprint of the rifle has been hit against his t-shirt before it actually happens and we think that it's because dale and shane were practicing you know rehearsal and or doing the scenes a couple times and yeah. that those little imprints were them doing this before. And yes, you can see them. I saw like three of them. It was yeah. really funny. Mm -hmm. Dale points out that Shane is exactly the chaos that is in this world, but he gives the guns back. And with this deep commentary on Shane's lack of morality and the way that he behaves, Shane is looking back at him with this utter contempt. And he says, fair enough, because he doesn't care about morality anymore. Something snapped in him when he found out about Lori being pregnant. Yes. He snapped, and now nothing matters. He's I mean, going to yeah. take control now. I mean, you know, he could get lucky and Andrea could get pregnant. Right? Let's go to the farmhouse porch. This is where everything just all comes to a head, really. Carl, Beth, and Patricia are playing a game. I couldn't really see what they were playing. Because the from the angle, you can see that it's a really thick board, uh -huh. but you can't see any of the pieces over the board. So you know it's not checkers, but it is a board game. More than likely, so you can't... It isn't chess, but it is a board game, so it's most likely checkers. Or Go. I don't know. It could be Go, but it's probably checkers, and I like to think that Carl has his checkerboard, and he's just playing with everyone. Yeah. He's like, we're going to play with Sophia, we're going to play with these other people, you know, checkers for everyone. Right? Yeah. Maggie and Carl are on the steps. And at this point, she's like, hey, give me your cap. I'll wash it for you. T-Dog comes up with Andrea to ask, well, where's what happened to Rick? He was supposed to meet us at the barn. We were going to go look for Sophia. And then Shane comes roaring up with the guns and, like, decides he's going to be like, everybody grab the gun. Let's arm the militia. And he's just stirring up trouble. And he start, he hands a gun to Glenn, who's already looking a little uncomfortable. And he turns to Maggie and he goes, can you shoot? And she goes, can you stop? Yeah. But Seriously. this is also echoing Herschel at the creek 
as as he goes, you've been killing the walkers. Can you stop? Mm-hmm. Can you stop? Is this really part of your nature? Right. There's something that really funny that happens here. So when the group sees that Rick and Herschel are coming back with two walkers at the end of poles, right before that, T-Dog is standing like a little behind Shane with like his right arm over like the back of his head. And then T-Dog swears and the camera does this movement where it like zooms in on him. But you see he is now, like, three times farther away from Shane. Yeah. And there's no way he could have done that in that amount of time. Because it's a totally different angle and it's totally longer. Weird continuity error. But that happens. So, yeah, they see see this happening. And uh, you can see that Herschel and and, um, Rick are coming up with the zombies in tow to go put them into the barn. And immediately Shane gets this furious look on his face and he's running up and he goes what is that what is that and he's yelling it and it's he's not saying this out of a lack of understanding like i don't understand what you're doing he's angry because rick is now challenging the authority that he believes himself to right have. but it's also like what you're saying is also what is that like why are you doing that yeah it's it's Rick joining Herschel's side. Why are you joining that side? Mm-hmm. You're on our side. You should be under me. Yeah. The group starts to move down to the barn. Shane is still stirring things up, yelling, screaming. Carl and Lori walk up, and Carl is holding his hurt side like the little actor that he is. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> I, it still hurts. Just reminding you. Yeah. Um, Shane straight out shoots the female zombie at the end of the pole. I'm sorry, who's dangerous now? Who yeah. is who is the danger? Yeah. People are looking at Shane like he is going crazy. Because he is. Because he is. Shane goes to tear open the barn door. So he tears off. Uh, there's like a, a, a lock on the bottom and then there's like a wooden beam and so he tears all of that off. But there's a chain with a lock up on like near the top of the doors. He does not tear that off. But he freely opens the door. Yeah. And the chain is no longer there. What yeah. up? Yeah, it's another continuity error. Yes, it is. So there, another continuity error in the scene is that you can see Andrea running up to Shane twice. Yeah. Did you see this happening? I didn't actually notice it, but I, I, I believe it. Right. So there's one part like where he stands there waiting for the walker to come, and she runs up, and then they change the angle to look at like who's on the right hand side, and you can see her running mm-hmm. again. Yeah, and at this point now, the the threat of the zombies is imminent. They're all coming out of the barn. They've got to do something, so people begin shooting. I want to bring up that during the shootout, Andrea is using the Beretta, the M9. Okay. In this, so none of these shots are going to be coming out of her uh, count. Right. Um, th- here comes one of my favorite parts of the scene. Not that the scene should be good, but the fact that Glenn kind of... Uh, sees Herschel like just distraught on the ground and Maggie is crying and kind of with her dad and Glenn is stuck in this moment where he knows he needs to protect people but he runs by Maggie and is like Maggie almost like is it okay and Maggie says it's okay mm-hmm. go do it yeah and I just I love I, I think it's like one of the best moments in the scene that he takes the time to consider what she's going through right now before he just and goes. then even then when he starts to shoot you can see on his face that this this hurts him now it's not necessarily him feeling for the zombies mm. he's feeling for her and every shot is hurting her so it's hurting him right it's great so we're starting to count the walkers as they come out of the barn now I can say that I counted 21 walkers. And what I had done is I had seen one shot where you had a whole bunch of them on the ground. Right. I counted them, and then I counted every zombie that came out afterwards. And as long as all the zombies were on screen at one point, there should be 22 of them. Right. I 
I kept getting confused because sometimes it looked like they were showing the same walker coming out two times. Mm -hmm. um, but when I, at the end of the episode, when you're kind of looking at everything on the ground, I counted 16. Yeah, that's what I counted too. Okay, so that, I think we can say that there were between 14 and 16 walkers, but technically it's between 15 and 17. Yes. Which we'll talk about in a minute. Herschel is gutted, mm -hmm. devastated. All of these people are dead. All people that he knew from his community, his family, they're all dead. They're all really truly dead. gone. Really dead. Re-dead. So all of a sudden, you see one last walker come out, which is why we're saying there's probably 15 to 17, because we only counted the ones on the ground. So she's the one left. If you look at her, it looks like she got bit on the shoulder. There's a very large gash on the top of her shoulder. Yeah, right so, at the joint between the neck and the shoulder. Right. Andrea looks like she's about to cry. Shane, his jaw is like dropped. Like, I don't think I've ever seen Shane look like that, ever. How he looks. It was like this. Not only was he shocked that she was there, but also like... Even though he was like, well, this is futile, she's lost. I don't think he ever expected that this was the outcome of what was happening. I, I looked at him and it almost looked like the soul had gone out of him. Yeah. He has been pushing all this time and probably thinking that Sophia is dead, but not thinking that Sophia is a zombie. Or that Sophia is dead on the property. Yeah. So close. Wow, good tracking skills, Shane. Yeah. Excellent. Um, Carol runs to Sophia, but Daryl catches her. And Lori and Carl are just, they, they are, they're done. Yeah. <laughs> they're done. What is Herschel really thinking at this moment? Um, because I think, you know, he obviously didn't know who Sophia was. He knew there yeah. was a girl that they were trying to find. Um, there was no picture of her, which was probably a bad thing. Yeah. Um, I think the moment that he realizes that this is the girl that they've been searching for this whole time and then realizes that they're going to kill her like they killed everybody else not only shares the pain with them but also i think he starts to realize that what the reality really is in mm -hmm. this situation and just think about how this is this person that they've been searching for this whole time has been there just a few yards away. Mm -hmm. And if only they had been communicating properly, they would have known. Yeah, true. And a lot of the pain and the bloodshed that came out of that would have been evolved, would have been saved. Exactly. So Rick steps up because uh, I believe he is still dealing with the regret of losing her in the first place and is saying to himself, I have to be the one to do this. Mm-hmm. There is this thing that I found, and I kind of heard this a little bit, but when Rick shoots Sophia at the end of the episode, directly after the gunshot, there is a sound of a shell casing hitting the ground. However, Rick is using a Colt Python revolver, which does not eject its shells. It seems that the sound effect dubbed in for the shot was that of an automatic pistol, which includes the sound of an ejected shell. I, I didn't hear any shells at all. Mm -hmm. I did hear Sophia hit the ground. That might be what we heard, yeah. But I don't doubt that they did do that. Because, yeah, a Colt Python, no revol very few revolvers reject shells. Mm -hmm. um, they hold in, and then when you flip it out to reload it, you have to take right. them out. Right, got it. This scene, even now, gets me. I remember oh, yeah. the first time I saw this scene, I never imagined that she would walk out. Of, no one imagined that she would walk out of this. This is not something that you read in the comics and know about beforehand. This is completely for this. I was gutted and shocked. And then when I saw it again, I was just still in it. You know, it's so heartbreaking for all these people who worked so hard to try to find her that they did find her, but it was like this. Mm. And that's, it just, it's crazy. Crazy to me. Um, that last shot, though, is looking down the barrel of Rick's gun, just like he was in that deleted scene at the beginning of the episode. Yeah. And really, that is the end of this episode. Pretty much already dead. 
the person that was killed, well, yeah, she was killed before, but Sophia is, you know, our, our person who was killed in this episode, really. The character we have to say goodbye to. Right. We have talked in the past about how there are a lot of the names in this, and I feel like we should call Shane the instigator because of what he does. He is not worthy of a nickname in my mind. All right, then we won't. <laughs> he is just doesn't deserve any kind of name. He's not even mm-hmm. called Shane anymore. He's just that guy. Mm-hmm. So like I said before, um, let's talk about some things in the comics. Sophia does outlive everyone except for Carl and Maggie. So... In the end of it, I believe those two are still alive Mm -hmm. in the comics. Um, Some really interesting things that happen in the comic part of this episode is that Herschel is basically screaming at... And and in the comics, Herschel is like the polar opposite of the Herschel in this TV show. He is brash. He is loud. He is kind of like Shane sometimes. So he goes up to the barn and he's like yelling and screaming and the barn opens and he gets knocked down and there that's when the massacre really starts and so once every all the walkers are shot he tells the group you need to go right now and uh at that point maggie tells glenn that she loves him and glenn decides he's going to stay on the farm Mm -hmm. Also, then at that point, Lori comes up and starts this whole yelling match with Herschel about why they can't leave. They need to stay because of the baby, yada, yada. And Herschel almost hits her. And then he pulls out a gun on Rick. And that's when he orders them to leave. Wow. So it's really crazy, I think, in the comic books how much of a difference it is from the Herschel we know in the show, who's kind of this quiet, angry man you yeah. know it, it it's very very interesting yeah so what are your thoughts on this episode as a whole i it just kind of guts you i mean there's a lot that happens and it's very high tense high tension but the, the cinematography like you said it, it interjects these moments of beauty even in the tension yeah it really does and then you end with that And I I kind of, I'm sitting there wondering, do we have a definite story of what happened to Sophia? Or is that always going to be a mystery? It's always a mystery, yeah. Because we know that she went to this house, or she may have gone to this house. We don't know for certain. It could have been some other child that Mm -hmm. hid there. Um, From the looks of it, it looks almost like she got bit and was walking around with the doll. And then got stuck they in the silk. dropped the doll, which they found, and then probably by the creek where she got stuck and Jimmy and Herschel went and got her out like they did with the other ones. Yeah. Where they also said that Otis used to do it too. That, how, that does kind of follow because they did have like a full day where they were searching for her before they found the farm. Mm-hmm. So it happened probably during that day. Right. Well, that is all we have for episode seven, pretty much done already. Next week, we talk about episode eight, Nebraska. Oh, yeah. Thank you for listening to Sunday of the Dead and exploring each episode with us. If you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode, feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com. We want to bring you new and exciting geek-worthy content. If you want to help, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes, and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support. Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Laney on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time. Geek out. <laughs>